All right, everybody, welcome back to Insights of All Trades. It's been quite a while since we've had an episode. Um, you know, with the giant pandemic that hit the entire world, we haven't really had the opportunity to get together and have guests on the show. But we discovered Zoom, which we've been using for our classes and whatnot, and there's a nice little recording feature on it. So we decided we would try and do some Zoom podcasts, and this will be our first one. So bear with us if there's any technical difficulties, but I'm sure we'll get it figured out. Um, before we introduce our guest here today, we'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Riganit Gear. And I know Cole has a Riganit Gear backpack here that he's going to show off for anybody watching the video. So take it away, Cole. Yeah, so just to preface this, before the whole COVID pandemic broke loose back in December when I was a naive 22-year-old buying plane tickets to Peru to hike to Machu Picchu, I knew that our past guest, Jacob, who's the founder of Riganet Gear, had hiked Machu Picchu, so I was asking him about it, and he said that he would sew me a pack that's kind of tailor-made to that hike because I was doing the same trail, which is the Salkente Trail, which is kind of like a scenic, uh, not so highly traveled trail to Machu Picchu. And it's like a five-day backpack, so I was super pumped for that. Unfortunately, I flushed like $800 down the drain for plane tickets, but I still got this awesome pack out of it, which I'm probably going to test run this weekend for a nice little 43-miler one day. So got this pack here. I think the stitching that he did is incredible. Um, you can see the little rig and it gear logo up top. You have like the outside compartment and then it, the way that it like, I don't know what the right word would be. You can see if you're watching the video, the bag kind of rolls down and clicks in in a way that it's waterproof for like the internal single compartment that's in there. So I think that's pretty nice. And then he also sent some rigging it gear fanny packs which was his first product to hit the market so they're very light um but with waterproof material which is nice um so yeah if you're on that ultra light school of thought for your hiking rigging it gear is the way to go yeah and i should mention i just ordered a few masks from rigging it gear they're making some masks for you know the coronavirus outbreak and have some pretty sweet designs so if you still need a mask or you want one to fit your wardrobe, go ahead and check out Riganet Gear. And uh, all right, let's shift gears a little bit too. We have a quote today, as per usual. This one comes from Tao Te Ching, which is like an ancient uh, religious Chinese religious text on Taoism. And so this one here is, is it kind of goes along with the theme of our show here today, but it was a leader is best when people barely know he exists of a good leader who talks little. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled. They will say, we did this ourselves. So I'm sure that'll make a little bit more sense when you guys hear, uh, hear from our guests today, but it kind of just goes to show that, or I guess it just kind of speaks to the, the idea of trying to stay humble and, and put out a good example rather than being the most vocal person in the crowd. Uh, what do you think about it, Cole? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it speaks to that maxim that we heard a lot growing up, which is let your actions speak louder than your words. So I think it's just, you know, it goes to show that even in texts that have been, you know, pre preceding us by thousands of years, that sort of same ideal was still present that the best leaders to follow are people that are leading with their actions, not so much their words. Right. Yeah, definitely. So do you want to introduce our guest for today? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I know that as we're recording this after we did the episode, we're very pumped about this. Um, my friend Hayden Hydley came on, who is a friend and also for all the wrestling fans, an absolute powerhouse of a wrestler. So in high school, he was a state champ in the state of Pennsylvania. And as you all know, Pennsylvania is the toughest state to wrestle in in high school. So to do that at the highest, the the most packed level, if you will, in PA at the AAA level with like the biggest schools to win states in a pretty crowded state bracket is pretty insane. But that was not enough. He went on to wrestle at NC State, who is now ranked sixth in the country. I think earlier this year they uh, 
topped a little bit higher in like fourth or fifth in the country, depending on the rankings that you looked at. And they're on quite the mean streak in terms of team performance ever since they're uh, uh, on the more recent uh, side of events, I think within the past decade, uh, Coach Pat took over and Hayden gets into that a little bit. So while Hayden was at Penn, or geez, Penn State, uh, thinking of near where he grew up, which is near Penn State, which we talk about as well in the episode, while Hayden was at NC State, he talks about his journey and how, you know, he has All-American twice, meaning he took at least top eight in the country. More specifically, he had an undefeated freshman season, made it to the finals, lost to who was arguably the absolute best person in the country at that time, Jason Knoll from Penn State. And then the year after that, he went back, wrestled Jason Knoll again in the semifinals in a very close, controversial in the very least match, which we kind of deconstruct as well in this episode. So he's... But then he also, he also mentioned that this year they... Um... They granted him an All-American title again. You know, didn't quite come the same way, but, uh, you know, he was ranked in that top eight again before the NCAAs, and and he ended up getting an All-American again. So I guess he would be three-time All-American, right? Yeah, I don't – depending on how uh, Hayden looks at it, we'll we'll, we'll say three-time. I don't know if him and all the other Division I wrestlers feel the same way with how that – panned out with nationals being canceled uh, due to the pandemic breaking out. But yeah, he is an, a freakishly good wrestler and even just a greater dude, which I'm sure you'll see as this episode kind of unfolds. So without further ado, here's the podcast. Welcome to Insights of All Trades podcast with Nick and Cole. This is where we talk with people we meet along our journeys through medicine, military service, sports, education, and beyond. We hope you enjoy. Hayden Hidley, what's up, dude? Not a whole lot. Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and you know talk about whatever and anything. Looking forward to it. How have you been with the whole pandemic and stuff going on? I think I'm like most people. I I think it's just very confusing and uh, you're kind of scrambling around to try to find a schedule. I think for somebody that is just so used to living almost the same week over and over again, it's very hard right now just because, you know, whether it's your training or you're in school, it feels like you're kind of living a similar week over and over again. And like, I, I find a lot of peace in that. And so to have everything just kind of, discombobulated right now it's like it's almost like I'm hard it's hard to find out if it's a weekend or a weekday but it's it's actually been good I've been been safe and I've been blessed to be around my family for the past few weeks and so I can't really ask a whole lot other than that and so you're back from NC State where you're you know wrestling at right now back in central PA um near Lewistown right yeah, so I'm I'm from I'm right in Lewistown. Um, it's about like a seven hour trip to NC State, and we were at the point uh, down there where there it wasn't a whole lot of it at being an advantage, like uh, staying down in North Carolina at this point. Um, and so we went back, just kind of be back with our family during this time. Um, but you know, we spent some time in North Carolina, but it was like it was very hard for us to get you know, any kind of like a legitimate wrestling training in. And so me and my brother decided to go back home and, you know, we have a a private workout facility and even mats in our garage where you can work out with. So that's been a much better um, environment for us. So I saw that quite a bit of the Southern states seem to be trying to open up a little bit more. Is North Carolina along those same lines or is it more like Pennsylvania where, you know, you can't really do too much yet? I would say North Carolina is progressing a little bit further in terms of uh, opening things back up and things being a little bit more loose. Um, it, it's it's hard to say, but I feel like Pennsylvania is very strict compared to the other states. And even in North Carolina, though, they're strict compared to what Georgia is right now, which is kind of almost a free for all where you can, it's almost opened up all the way back. And so North Carolina is still like, you're not allowed sitting in restaurants or anything like that. Um, but it's just more, um, I feel like more businesses are open uh, and uh, 
it's not, there's not as much of a restriction on terms of which are essential and which aren't. Um, I guess that's the easiest way for me to sum it up, but um, Pennsylvania is definitely more strict and uh, definitely you don't have to be wearing a face mask or at, at all times down in North Carolina. So that was a, a big difference whenever I first walked back into like a gas station on my way back. Um, and I did have one in the car, but I forgot to put it on and there was people screaming around in there. So I went <laughs> and uh, boosted out of that gas station pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Um, so, you know, I think something that a lot of people are pretty interested in, obviously just like sports in general, uh, not many people really know when it's coming back or anything. Do they keep athletes like you in the loop of, you know, Hey, we're going to be having our winter season starting up here or, we're going to be wrestling only in the ACC or anything like that. Do they keep you guys in the loop or is it you're just as far in the dark as the rest of us? To be honest with you, we're pretty far in the dark. Um, what, as an athlete, what we can hope for at this point is that the fall sports um, start to get back in gear at some level. I think that's what the consensus is right now um, at like a major like division one university what they're trying to do is maybe phase in the fall sport teams inside the facility, um, and maybe in small groups. Um, but they're not going to – I think they're putting their focus on them first. And so I think you might see in, I don't know, maybe a month or so um, or a few weeks, they might start phasing in some of the fall sports teams, and they might be working out at like a small group basis. But I don't believe they're going to let all athletes back on campus and training together in like the, that facility. Um, all at the same time and so there there is some hope there um, what we've all been hoping for is that they can somehow uh, find a way to you know create a, a good atmosphere for the fall sports teams where they can play um, because it's going to be hard if, if there's no fall sports it's going to be pretty hard for the other sports to follow suit um, just because football is such an amazing like such a, a cultural activity and if football is not happening there's a good chance that you know other sports outside of that might not be happening as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of optimism, I think at this point, just because they are trying, like the schools are trying to find a way where, you know, they can keep people safe and, and still have them trained. So I would say ultimately in a couple of weeks, I think you're going to see some fall sports um, come back and it might not be like all in uh, where the whole team is training at the same time, but I think you could find some small group stuff where they're going to be able to get those uh, teams in shape in order to compete um, come fall. So kind of along those same lines, and just to fill in the blanks for anyone not closely following the NCAAs, for our, I don't know if it was all of the winter sports, but at least for wrestling, the national tournament kind of got wiped away last minute. Um, I know they kind of wrestled the different conferences, and at one point, if I remember correctly, they just called off having like a crowd, the audience at the, uh, the national tournament. And then very last minute, they uh, wiped out the national tournament. So with that comes a whole bag of emotions and whatnot that aren't really going to be pleasant for anyone, especially the, the graduating seniors. But beyond that, I know that they've been spitballing solutions. Do you know anything about, you know, proposed solutions or, you know, solutions that actually got off the ground um, for the winter athletes, especially with wrestling? So um, I guess going through that whole situation, we, as a team, we finished up with the ACC tournament and uh, we came back to Raleigh. We, we had ACCs in Pittsburgh and everything was fine. There was no fan restriction or anything like that. So we went and had the ACC tournament. Um, we came back to Raleigh and uh, we were training there that week. And I believe it was Thursday – or no, it was Tuesday when they announced that um, there was not going to be any fans at the NCAA tournament. And so Tuesday goes by. We're just really confused with how everything's going. They released the brackets um, for the NCAA tournament on Wednesday. And then Thursday is whenever they announced that there wasn't going to be a tournament. So all in those three days was just one crazy just – just, I mean, it, it all hit us in the face because we had no idea. Like, we had no, we nobody foreseen anything like that just because we just got done with the ACC tournament and it felt like everything was normal. Um, but I, I think whenever we had the meeting of whenever they announced it, the ACC um, conference, they said that no um, ACC affiliates will be going to the national championship. So we know 
we knew we weren't going before they announced that there wasn't going to be like a tournament. And so they basically told us uh, as a team and just said, listen, we're going to try our best to um, maybe get you guys an extra year. But for now, the, the tournament's canceled. It's definitely not postponed. It's canceled. And so that was just a, like a, a crazy moment for us just because we're so used to being together and we see the toughness of all of us. And especially in a sport like wrestling where, you know, it's, it's, it's hand-to-hand combat to some extent. And uh, you see how tough guys are. But in that moment, I mean, it's just – it floored all of us. And you just see a whole lot of vulnerability just because something that you're working for, you know, not just for nine months, but for your whole life was, was just taken away in a snap of the finger. And so after that, our, our coaches went to the best they, – they did the best they could to try to get us, you know, like a, a hardship waiver where we could, you know, come back for another year. Um, but – Basically, they said, NCAA said that no winter sports will be allowed to have an extra year of eligibility. The spring sports, it's on a school-by-school basis. And so at NC State, if you were a senior in a school sport and your season got canceled, you have the option to come back next year and have one more year. But if you're a freshman, sophomore, or junior, it just counts as a lost year of eligibility. And at some schools like uh, Wisconsin, they said that even if you were a senior, they weren't going to offer um, the extra year, which is, I mean, that, that's, I just couldn't believe that. Um, that's kind of hard to think about. And so for somebody like me who was a junior, and luckily our whole team um, or our, our starters, um, we didn't have a, a senior on our, our, our starting lineup. And so all of us are going to be back next year. But, I mean, in the end, it was almost of, of a wasted year. I mean, it's it's hard to say that because of all you went through. and. Um, all the achievements that we had, but I mean, in, in the sport of wrestling, a lot of it, uh, and a lot of your success is just judged off of how you do with NCAA's. And so, what they did uh, at the end, they recognized that, and they kind of came up with like, a, you know, if you were a top eight seed at the NCAA tournament, you got first team All American. If you were eight to twelve, you got second team All American, and if you were a thirteen to sixteen seed, you got honorable mention All American. And so. That was more of like, uh, I mean, we, they wanted to reward people um, some way. And so that's kind of what we're stuck with at this point. Yeah, it, I would imagine, of course, I don't have the same relationship to wrestling as you do and other Division One athletes since I competed at the D3 level and more so was just doing it because I had a like, love for the sport. But the way that I would imagine that, that it feels like it was kind of just like a participation trophy at that point because you didn't really get to compete. You and I both know that there's so many variables that go into a performance at the NCAs that the, the seating does matter. There's a, a reason that they carry some amount of weight, but they're never a perfect predictor of what's going to happen. So to base those essentially participation trophies off of seeding seems, I don't know, maybe a little unfair. <laughs> at yeah, best. I get that. I definitely, I see that point of view and it's very hard to reward things in the sport of wrestling based off paper. And that's kind of what it ended up being. It was your body of work throughout the year. And so like it was a year long award. Um, but I mean, for somebody that's just so used to competing and, and like, earning earning everything that you get it, it's a bit it doesn't feel the same like it, it definitely doesn't feel the same to be rewarded first team all-american whenever two years previous i went through the gauntlet of wrestling at the ncaa tournament and, and finishing the top eight it, it just wasn't the same as that um i mean i don't know I, I feel like they had to do something so i'm not against what they did it just it doesn't feel the same there's no way you convince people that it feels the same yeah i agree and you brought up you, you know, all American the last uh, two years, and I'm really itching to segue into that. But before that, um, Nick and I are both cognizant enough of our listener demographics to know that we aren't really a, a wrestling centric podcast. So we might have a lot of l- listeners that, uh, you know, think it's cool that there's a college athlete on here, but they don't know much about wrestling. So I think before we kind of go into, you know, what this tournament or tentative tournament was going to possibly mean for you to have that shot at the national title again. Um, I think we should maybe first kind of bookmark that 
and segue into exactly what wrestling is and what it's all about for anyone that might be a little confused before we get into the nuances of things. So as silly as it sounds, because I know this is maybe a little unorthodox with all the interviews and podcasts that you've done, but kind of explain wrestling to us as if we were like parents that want to get their five or six year old into wrestling. What would you tell them? Yeah, so I mean, I think when people think of wrestling, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously, you know, growing up with like WWF or WWE in the Attitude Era and like, you know, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and things like that. And, you know, that's just, a, it's a powerhouse of, of just popularity in terms of WWE. And so a lot of kids, to be honest with you, whenever they want to join their school wrestling team, they have somewhat of an idea of, all right, I want to go like in, into the ring and like throw chairs around and, and jump off of ladders and stuff like that. And that's definitely not the case. Um, it's like, uh, it's, it's definitely nothing like the WWE or WWF, but um, that's where a lot of people get their first kind of conception of, of what wrestling is. But in my um, opinion, just to how to sum up wrestling Wrestling is like a sport that tests, you know, your full body. Um, you know, it's not a, a sport where you can be um, one dimensional. I think that's probably the best way to describe it in terms of skills. There has to be a variety of skills and there has to be a variety of a mixture of, you know, speed, strength, um, you know, using your mind to, you know, uh, you know, master techniques. That that's probably the best way to sum it up. Is just a, it's an all around sport where um, I like to tell people that wrestling it, it it produces athletes that you know you wouldn't ever think would be a wrestler just because people can kind of find their own um, skill set and find their own way to be good at it. So all my life I've seen guys who are are tall and skinny, but you know they're able to find a way to be good at wrestling by using their body type and by mastering that technique that you know matches their skill set. But then I've seen guys who are, are short and stocky and, and muscular who do just as well, or people that are just kind of like average looking where you'd think, you know, how are you in a sport like wrestling where it's based off a of hand-to-hand combat? And uh, it's a lot of it is just based on, you know, finding what you're best at and being able to model kind of a game plan around that. And so uh, you know, that's kind of a, a long version to describe it. It's very hard to explain, but Another, I think it just, it parallels um, into other um, combative sports. Just like if you look at um, like the UFC, like people like Conor McGregor or, um, you know, everybody, all the stars like Brock Lesnar, you know, they, they all have wrestling in their game to some extent. And although it's not an extreme hand-to-hand combat sport, it still tests your whole body in a way where you are kind of trying to break the the will of, a, of an opponent while you're out on the mat. Um, and so it's, it has a lot of parallels of sports like that and uh, very um, intricate rule set that I definitely won't go into on this podcast. Um, but we could the, touch on it a tiny bit. Okay. But basically the, the basic premise of, of the sport of wrestling is controlling an opponent and being able to take them down, being able to hold them, um, and being able to escape from them whenever they're in, in an offensive position. That's kind of the main, um, the main goal of it, of it all. Yeah. So, I feel like if we were to, sorry, Nick, if we were to encapsulate it in just like a sentence or two, at least if I were to try to explain it to like parents who were interested in getting their kids into wrestling, it's, it is essentially hand to hand combat. It's, a legal fight in a way, but with removing the striking that you would see in something like MMA and removing the submissions like chokeholds and different joint destroying submissions that you would see in MMA as well. And you're kind of just left with the grappling where your goal is to use your body to overcome their body and either take them down. And if you can to turn them and expose their their shoulders to the ground but even at like a more abstract level the way I think of it and I think I might be paraphrasing Joe Rogan here and describing combat sports in general it's kind of like chess or some sort of 
high level problem solving, but with intense physical consequences that come along with it. So I think you alluded to there is that mental aspect of it in that you have to kind of outsmart and out technique your opponents, um, which are always going to be roughly like the same size as, as you. Of course, there's differences in physique, but that's why we're always competing in weight classes. So to you know get an advantage you have to be smarter or you know faster in a different way be able to change directions quick there's so many little details that that go into it but i feel like that's uh kind of how i think of it what were you going to say nick i was just going to say if this is kind of for either or both of you guys if you could kind of touch on the team aspects of the sport because you know a lot of it i hear about is being individually tough and being individually able to you know put out your best performance, but there is still a team aspect to the sport. How important is that to you guys? And, and what is, you know, what, the, what is the team aspect of it? Yeah. So for the team aspect of wrestling, it is at, at its core, an individual sport. And at the end of the year, you are rewarded in terms of how good you are as an individual, but you know, it's, it's a very strange sport where the entire regular season is made up of team events. And at the end of the year, you, compete individually so for the most part of the season you are competing with a team and that's kind of bait it's I mean how you do in, the, in those matches um, will determine kind of how what your seat is at the NCAAs or in the postseason so for me I've always taken a great joy in the team aspect of it just because it's kind of a crazy sport where you're all individually out there there's nobody else helping you um, you know for example in football I think I, I hear this example a lot of you know, you can sometimes hide on a football field. You know, one guy can take a play off, and it might not necessarily mean that it's not going to be successful. And wrestling, you know, there's nobody out there to save you. And so it's, it's one versus one, and everybody has all their eyes on you. Um, but what people don't see behind the scenes is, is you've got a group of, you know, 30, 35 people all working towards the same goal. They're all going to the same practices, doing the same sort of technique, same drills. Um, and so a lot of the training um, is not possible without being together with like a like a like minded group of people. Um, just because you push each other so much and, you know, the individual success has come from, you know, kind of being together as a group. And when I think back at some of like my my favorite moments um, as a wrestler, most of them have been with my team and kind of the successes that we've had as a team, um, especially in high school, I think just growing up and going through um, a time where you're trying to find your identity, I think uh, being able to find that support group through a team and uh, sharing moments with those people, that was very special to me. Yeah. And I know your brother has pretty much been on your wrestling team ever since, you know, both of you guys have been wrestling together and he followed you to NC state. Is that right? So could you talk a little bit about what that's like having your brother on, on your same team? Yeah. So, um, all the, all, all the way back until when, whenever we started, I was six years old. Um, I wrestled for a year. And then after that, Trent was five years old and he's, he wrestled with me. So, you know, there was only one year of my life where I wasn't wrestling with him. Uh, and so, um, it has been a, a journey, uh, to say the least. Uh, but, I feel like we've grown um, as friends, as brothers, and, and as teammates throughout all those. And just because we've had moments where, um, you know, we are just two completely different people in, in terms of, you know, what motivates us and, and how we interact with people, um, that sometimes there is like a little bit of friction of, of how we were going to work together. Um, and so when we were coming of age and, um, you know, he – went on his path and I went on my path, but we did it together. I think that was probably the, the best thing for us. Uh, we go about our business in a very different way, but in the end uh, we want the same results. And so, you know, there's a, there's a certain point where you're cut from the same cloth, but um, we do things in a very different way. And for example, um, you know, when, when he goes to practice or something like that, you know, he likes to, you know, uh, talk to people, joke around beforehand and, for me, I like to have just kind of like 10 minutes myself where I just get ready and I get in my peaceful zone where I know that, you know, I've got to go through practice and that's not always easy, but it's a, a time of the day that I really enjoy. And so how we um, kind of go about our business is much different, but 
you know, like I said earlier, you know, we want the same results and we want the same end goal. And so we match really well together and in terms of motivating each other um, and keeping each other in check for sure that that has been, you know, the best thing to be able to have somebody that is so elite and high level that you can kind of learn from each other and also keep each other in balance whenever things are, are maybe going you know, off the path. And so there's not a whole lot of me having to mentor him at this point, just because he is so good at what he does and I can respect that and I can, you know, let him figure out some of the things and just guide him along the way that that's been the greatest kind of learning curve to go through with somebody just because it, it gives a lot of kind of, it gives a lot of, um, experience with how you should live your life with with some people yeah i heard you say on a previous interview if i took a shot in the dark i think it's one that uh flow wrestling did with you the like half an hour one that i think bader did with you mm -hmm. and you said something along the lines of if you were both leonard skinnerd songs you would be simple man and trent would be free bird mm -hmm. so and of course you say that jokingly and kind of tongue-in-cheek mm -hmm. but uh Along those lines, though, and, and also based on what, we're, what you're saying now, if you had to kind of uh, categorize your differences in personality, not just what shows up with wrestling, but I'm guessing how you kind of approach everything in general, would you say that you're more so like stoic or at the very least like cerebral about things and Trent's a little more free-spirited and you know, joking around as, as things progress. Yeah, it's, I would say there's a little bit of that, but what people don't always see is, yeah, Trent's very outgoing and energetic, but to me, that's just passion. And he's a very passionate person in terms of his personality and how he works out. Um, like if you go into the wrestling room on any given day, you're going to see him yelling around and, um, he's very motivated through, you know, bringing one of those guys to get up and go kind of guy where he's behind you yelling and saying like, you know, we have, we got this. Or people, or people, people that have this, like this. There's no sorry, I think the audio went out a little bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you there. Right. Yeah. So, like Trent, like uh, like whenever people aren't doing the right things, there's no censorship in terms of of him feeling like he's gonna make an enemy or or um, you know, rub somebody the wrong way because it just doesn't care about things like that. And um, you know, that's a great person to have on your team is just somebody who's passionate and and can just you know, control. They they can work a room. You know, they can talk to anybody. And for me, I would say I'm I'm more in the laid back side of things. Um, I don't like to have to um, yell around or say things, but whenever I say things, I hope they're simple, but significant in the end. Um, and I think whenever you see us compete, it's a pretty good summarization of how it goes. And he's running along the sidelines, yelling um, at the refs and at us, um, you know, cheering me on. But whenever he wrestles, I can't, I just have a hard time being able to stay in that moment and not be so nervous. So there's a lot of me just standing in the background and it looks like there's not a whole lot going on for me, but inside my mind, I've got, you know, circles running at a thousand miles an hour. And so when I gave that interview and I said, you know, if we were Leonard Skinner songs, I would be simple man and he'd be free bird. In the end, you know, we're cut from the same cloth and it's, it's a, the same sound, the same goals of, of what we want, but, you know, he's just a little bit more um, outgoing and in terms of what he wants to wear and in terms of fashion or in terms of his haircuts, um, he goes all out. And it, it his sort of expressions and personality show a lot more than I do. Um, for the past probably four years, I've had the same haircut <laughs> um, uh, every single time. And so for me, I, try, I just try to keep things as simple as I can because, um, you know, there, there's a lot going on to every person. But for me, um, I'm very stoic in terms of, you know, how I present myself to, you know, the vast majority of people. But I think the, the people that are close within my circle, you know, they see my personality show, um, but it doesn't always do it. Uh, it doesn't always do it that way whenever I'm just kind of out in the open or around a lot of people. And so 
that's probably a great way to describe ourselves. I didn't know any other better way to do it at the time, just because I was on a Laird Skinner kick, I guess. Um, but I think he, I think he respects that. And I think he understands um, how we're both wired in a way. Do you feel like now that you've been in a national spotlight for several years, do you feel yourself becoming more outgoing and more talkative and things like that? Or you think you're kind of sticking to how you've always been? To be honest with you, I think um, growing up now has made me a little bit of the opposite way. I would say I'm more um, more aware of my surroundings whenever I'm around, like whenever I'm out in public or anything like that. I feel like I'm more um, closed in in terms of uh, being outgoing just because I think in high school, we, I think we all go through a little bit of stage of trying to figure out who you are. And I feel like in high school, I didn't necessarily have that you know, firm sense of, of identity yet. And so I think I was more al along the edge of, edge of arrogant. And, you know, I, I went about my way on social media in a way that I probably shouldn't have. And I was just very just, I didn't have a whole lot of a filter, I think. But growing now and just seeing kind of the dangers of, of, of getting to that, um, I feel like I'm very closed off in terms of you know, speaking my mind or, or speaking an opinion, I just don't really like to get into conflict with people. And so I think I'm just more aware of my uh, surroundings and my environment now more so than I was a few years ago, just because I know there's a lot of people that um, wish they could be in my shoes. And I want to try to, I, I want to take advantage of everything that I've been given in, in terms of, you know, my opportunities. And I don't, I don't want to, um, I, I don't really want to segment like any people of, of, uh, of not liking what I have to say, I know I have a voice in terms of that things. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to talk about a lot of things, um, but I'm not really willing to um, share every little detail of myself. I just don't, I don't live my life that way. Um, there's very few people who, who know those things. And I, I'm fine with that. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of people have different opinions um, on how much somebody should be sharing about themselves. But, for me, I, I've just always been comfortable with who I am and not feeling like I have to overdo it. Yeah, I don't know if that's like a nature or nurture thing, but I kind of feel like I have the same sort of natural predisposition. I don't know if I would say I'm non-confrontational. Historically, I'd say I'm pretty non-confrontational if it's outside of wrestling, but I certainly feel like I've always been kind of reserved in like sharing the little details. Um, kind of asking out of, out of curiosity because I don't know if I can pinpoint, you know, how I arrived at that. But when you say that you kind of now have that sort of stoic personality in, in the spotlight, was it someone that you looked up to, whether it's like a mentor role or someone that kind of showed you by example that, you know, made you think that was the way that you wanted to act and present yourself? Or did that kind of just happen naturally? I think I got a lot of it from my dad, um, for sure. I think just growing up with him and what I saw from him was just somebody that um, was so driven towards their goals and and just so serious about it that I wanted to take what he had and, and his disposition, um, how he was able to just have that get up and go every day where you know he went out and, and did his best to give us opportunities. And you know, growing up, you just say like crazy things all the time. And I can always remember my dad saying, don't say that in front of other people. And so it's like, I feel like I learned how to um, not be reserved. I don't, I don't mean anything like that, but uh, just be aware of, of other people. And I think it, I think when I, how I describe um, that example to others is like, I don't, um, I don't talk a whole lot about like politics or anything like that, just because I don't, I don't feel the need to put myself in one, one side or one box. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people get upset over somebody, over one opinion, but you know, in my daily life, I have friends that span all different, you know, mindsets, all different ideas and their background. And so I wouldn't ever try to, um, you know, discredit somebody just for having one opinion. And so I feel like if I ever said like, just my opinion on something um, controversial, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have, you know, somebody look at me and be like, right, I'm discrediting them for saying that. And so, although I have that reservation, um, I feel free to talk to my friends 
you know, in face to face in person um, over things like that, just because I know and they know that we're close enough to do that. And and still we can talk freely about things um, without having any kind of, uh, uh, you know, breakup or or, uh, ill feelings towards the end of it. You know, I feel like that's just maturity. And I, I definitely got that from my dad. Uh, just because I, I was able to see the way that he worked and, um, you know, how he was able to let his personality show to the people that meant the most to him. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a good way to, to go about it, really. Um, but, you know, you've clearly made a name for yourself on, you know, the national, national scales as far as being an amazing wrestler. But obviously it wasn't always that way. So you got to this point through, I'm sure, a ton of hard work and dedication and probably, um, you know, some natural ability in there as well. Um, so would you mind talking a little bit about how you got to where you're at now and kind of how it all started? Yeah, absolutely. I think you nailed on the head. There is a lot of things that had to go right. Um, for one, I, I have a lot of natural ability. I think I, I got to credit my parents for that for just, not just, you know, physical attributes or, you know, my dad was a college athlete and sports were very big in our, our lives growing up. That was a way for us to connect. Um, it wasn't all, we never talked about it in that way, but that's was, that was the way for me, my brothers, my sister, my dad, and my mom coming to all the sporting events. You know, that was a, a very, you know, great connection for us. And just, we were instilled with this natural ability to compete. And I think um, that has helped me out so much. And, you know, my parents never, um, settled for, you know, less than our best. And so that just had a natural kind of progression into sports. And, um, you know, I grew up playing football, baseball, wrestling. Um, a lot of times, you know, they would intersect and I'd be doing two sports at once, but, uh, you know, I always had that drive and it was, there was never, um, you never allowed the, to take, to sit on the couch or, or spend a season not doing sports. If you were, if you were going to be, there with us you know you might as well be playing sports and we just enjoyed it so much that it was never an issue and so there's a bit of that natural ability there's a bit of that just drive to compete as an athlete um and then I think the the work comes in after that um again I I was really lucky enough to have those two things beforehand before the work came in and so there was always a bit of that ability where, you know, I feel very lucky that I had it. And I feel very lucky that I had parents that supported me throughout this. Um, but the work itself, I think it was, it was a lot of, of me trying to prove them right. I think you see a lot in athletes today, their motivation is, um, I want to prove somebody wrong. Um, I want to prove my teachers. I want to prove my community um, that doubted you. I, I didn't have a whole lot of that. Just because I never, you know, just being the person I am, I don't listen to a whole lot of that kind of thing. I don't, um, I don't really weight people's opinions that think poorly of me. And so um, I wanted to prove more people right than wrong. And so I think by just getting all the support I had from my parents and all of the drive I had from, uh, from my brothers, it was like, all right, I can work hard and I can get, I can achieve, you know, great things with what, with how I'm set up. And so you know, the work comes in and it's, it's not easy. Um, especially being in a sport like wrestling where, you know, you really do have to pay attention to detail and you have to be disciplined and you have to work on your whole body. You know, it's a very painful process of getting to a high level of competition. Um, but I, I saw the motivation from my parents. I saw the motivation from my community who saw like promise in me and they, you know, all growing up, I I was, I was a good wrestler and, uh, you know, there wasn't many times where I didn't, you know, have a a goal of of becoming a division one wrestler or, or being a a national champion just because I had, I had seen the people that were coming before me and I just felt like I could do what they were doing. And so luckily growing up, I had, um, a couple guys that went to my high school that were division one wrestlers. Um, and, I saw what they were doing and I was trying to copy them. And so, you know, outside of my house, I have this big hill um, and the high school team for Lewistown would come and they would run the hill. Um, You know, they'd do like 10 sprints um, up or, you know, do buddy carries and stuff like that. And so whenever they would come after school, 
uh, my dad would tell me and my brothers to go out and run with him. And so we were, you know, seven, eight years old at the time. And we were running with those high school kids. And I just kept thinking myself, all right, I, if I'm doing this with these people and I can continue to work as if I'm training to become a, a great athlete, you know, there's no reason for me not to um, with all that I've been given. And so uh, uh, my favorite story of my dad, uh, just like with competitiveness is alongside of this hill, it's probably like a, I don't know, it's probably 300 yards of pretty severe incline and up, up the road, he would put, you know, district six, uh, like a quarter way up. And then, you know, a halfway up, he'd have Northwest regional tournament. And then after that, it would be, you know, beast of the East or other like great high school tournaments. And at, at the top of the hill, it was like PIAA. And so it was just a great sort of motivation for me to be able to run up the hill and see, you know, how far I was going. And that was the end goal. Um, and so that was just one of the cool things of, about growing up and working hard um, that I remember the most. Dang, that's crazy. Do you feel like uh, maybe I'm like doing a little too much assigning of my own journey with wrestling here, but for me, there was like a mark, a marked transition from doing, you know, the, the sport in season, going to practices and then forgetting about wrestling as soon as the season ended, which then turned into for me, I'm certain much later than it did for you, uh, early in high school, falling in love with it in a way that I wanted to train year round. And there was no sort of breaks in between, you know, the normal season and going to club practices. And it was something that became nonstop 24 seven training with the exception of maybe one week off a year of, you know, not focusing intensely on, on wrestling training. Was there like a transition of that happening for you or did you start wrestling year round kind of from the beginning? Well, I would say that there was a year round aspect of it, but it didn't happen for me until I was later um, and more mature to be able to do something like that. I think a lot of times, you know, athletes, you know, when, when you're like in fifth grade, there's no reason that you need to be doing the same thing all year round. If you want to go out and play football or play baseball with your friends. And then, you know, even if you're, that's not your best sport, um, that was something my parents, um, you know, were pretty, um, I mean, they were really good about was just saying like, yeah, you don't, my, my chops were definitely in wrestling like all my life, but I still really enjoyed playing baseball. I still really enjoyed football. And so at that point, you know, there's not a whole lot of, you don't need to be completely bought in when you're a fifth grade kid. And so I played like three sports up until I was in eighth grade and the reason why I stopped was just because one, I, I saw the writing on the wall, you know, I was five foot four and was like a hundred pounds in eighth grade. And I was like, all right, there's, there's no way I'm going to be any kind of division football player. <laughs> it was like, there, there's just not, there's not here for me. And um, I was able to see kind of the success that my older brother had in football. And I was like, I'm nothing like him. And so I don't need to be doing this. It's not giving me a whole lot of joy. Um, and baseball is a little bit of the same way. And so at that point I was like, all right, I'm just going to focus full time on wrestling. And I was able to do it in a way where I didn't get burned out from it just because I was finding new people to go and train with. I was finding, you know, uh, different like styles of training or, or things like that. And I just, it was like a fresh start after each season. I like, uh, after the regular season would end, I would, you know, I'd take a couple of days off and regroup. Um, but then it was like, all right, I've, I've done this and it, this is what gives me peace. And so I don't, I don't see any need to stop. And um, I feel like, especially in high school, I gained so much from, uh, you know, training out of season. I feel like that was where I made my biggest gains just because I, I was doing a lot of things that others weren't. Uh, I felt like, you know, whether it was finding somebody who could train me in terms of, of lifting. And luckily I had a, a junior high coach who, you know, kind of took me under his wing and, and really, you know, informed me about, you know, the benefits of, of strength training. I feel like once I did that, I was doing that three or four days a week. I was wrestling three to four days a week. I was running two to three days a week. It was like, all right, you're kind of creating a perfect storm for somebody that wants to keep getting better. And um, I just focused in on, on who I wanted to be and who, and, and who I could be in the moment. And that was just, it was very helpful for my, my career to be wrestling full time. So just to pick your mind a little bit, 
and I know it's tricky to get prescriptive about these things, but if a wrestling parent had a kid that was having a ton of fun wrestling and they wanted to sort of coalesce the kid's love for wrestling with giving them a chance to become really good at the sport, if that's what they wanted to do and they weren't kind of forced into it, on top of not pulling the kids away from other sports, say if they want to play baseball or football early on, is there any other things that you would recommend, you know, parents doing for their kids to maybe make them a better all around athlete or cultivate a love for the sport just to like plant the seed a little bit. Something that comes to my mind is um, some friends that we share the bites family who had a, a couple of the bites boys wrestle at Penn state. They put all of the boys in gymnastics early on to kind of cultivate an all around body awareness and trust um, in their body with different kinds of movements. Is there anything like that that you think wrestlers uh, could benefit from? Yeah, absolutely. I was about to say gymnastics just because there's nothing that really um, teaches you about your body's awareness and the things that it can do quite like gymnastics. And um, there's a lot of studies about it. Just like whenever you're three to four years old, that's something that, that kids can do just to learn their bodies in a, in a better way. Um, I would say that I didn't have that structured gymnastic growing up, but there was enough of like rolling around and learning how to do cartwheels and basic things like that, that I was learning through wrestling. Um, that was so important. So like whenever I teach wrestling to kids now, before we do anything, I'll do like 15 minutes of skill drills. doesn't matter if it's a, if I'm doing an all day camp or like a two hour practice, I'll do like 15 minutes of skill drills where they're kind of learning how to navigate their body in terms of things like, you know, doing somersaults over people or, or, um, you know, learning uh new acrobatics or just doing basic cartwheels if they can't do anything like that just because in college now you know we spend at least two days a week warming up where we'll do front hand springs back hand springs cartwheels um uh doing like three in a rows where you're doing like a somersault into um a cartwheel into something else and uh, i just think it's it's really cool how you're able to you know learn from it um, in high school, I wasn't really good at it, but I was kind of introduced to it. Um, and I was able to just learn, you know, how to do a back handspring, how to do a basic thing. And you started to learn to trust yourself a little bit more with your body. And, you know, that helps out a lot in wrestling just because one, you're, you're so used to being in like mangled kind of positions that other people can't, um, you know, a lot of times I hear wrestlers say, well, I'm not that flexible. Uh, I mean, in terms of other athletes, you definitely are um, because you can put certain other athletes in this position and they're not going to be able to, you know, last without blowing something out. And so like growing up, like doing gymnastics would be really key. And I think also um, like it depends on where you are, but like I kind of wish I had a little bit more of like uh, an opportunity to do something like jujitsu uh, just because I see like the like the benefits of, of more of like mental side of things from that sport. Um, and I, I've seen some studies. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but um, whenever they, uh, they took this like one study of, of the best sports for um, kids with like uh, ADHD or, or kids with autism. And it turns out um, sports involving uh like wrestling or jujitsu or anything like that has been the greatest, um, you know, benefit for them. You know, other sports don't tend to be able to capture their interest or be able to, you know, lead them into activities that, you know, make them be aware of themselves. And, and uh, I think that's just really cool. I think there's needs to be more um, done on that just because I think that, you know, kids that have like a hard time, uh, you know, sticking to a schedule or, or sticking to just being able to pay attention at, at a, at a longer level. I think like a sport like wrestling or, or jujitsu just does so well because they're so in the moment and, you know, they can kind of control what they want to do in, in, in some aspects, you know, they can um, learn for themselves and also, you know, pick up new techniques that they really like. And it doesn't have to be like a, okay, at this minute, you're going to do this drill. And in 15 minutes, we're going to stop and do another drill. It's more of like a flowing of, of kind of using your creativity throughout a practice. Yeah, I agree. And just speaking for myself personally, 
when I had gotten into wrestling for the second time since I did it as a kid, but then stepped away from it until my freshman year of high school, what kept me there was this idea that it was, it gave me an outlet to do hard things. And it kind of reinforced the self narrative that I'm capable of doing hard things, even if it's unprecedented, even if I go until I throw up or puke or fill in the blank with some very hard thing. I think the thing that kept me coming back is doing the hard things on my own and also being surrounded by people like the Bites and the, the, you know, the coaches that are like really tough, seeing them do hard things and having that like, uh, team aspect of mutual suffering together and doing really hard things is what made it special. So even though I am fortunate enough not to, you know, have some sort of cognitive ailment or serious mental health problems, there's still a benefit even for a, we'll, we'll call it like a, a mentally and cognitively well-rounded person. Um, just to go through that struggle, I haven't been doing jujitsu long, but I've kind of been getting my feet wet with it for a couple of years now. And I feel like it's kind of along the same lines, even though the positions get a little bit different, it's still a one-on-one -on -one kind of combat without striking. So you can go hard really like essentially every day um, <laughs> with both wrestling and jujitsu, as opposed to something like uh, Muay Thai or MMA where the striking might get you beat up a little bit. But I think having something like that you can dive into on a daily basis is is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you brought up about how you can use like wrestling skills and other areas of your life in terms of um, going through struggle and coming out in the end and, and looking at it and thinking, wow, that was actually good for me in the long run. Um, I use that a lot in terms of, you know, when I was going through like business classes at NC State, um, a lot of what, you know, the guests would say or professors would say is, you know, as an employee, um, what's your tolerance for ambiguity like? Uh, how, how do you respond to change? And that's what they're looking for out of employees in today's world, just because um, a lot of people don't always have the, the ability or the experience in overcoming, uh, you know, negative things. Or if you're thrown into a project where, you know, you thought that it was going to be um, like a three-week project, but the demands are now are harder, and you need to find a way to deal with that ambiguity. You know, that was one of one of my professors told us as a class, and I just couldn't help but think that I've been thrown in so many of those situations through the sport, and uh, you know, I feel like I'm I'm prepared for that, and like I feel like wrestling has prepared me to be a great employee in terms of, you know, I've been in through some rough situations where you know maybe you're dealing with an ailment where you're you have to find a, a way to wrestle or or if you're in hour two of a practice and you thought it was going to be done about a half hour ago um you still got to get the most out of it and i feel like that's been the greatest um kind of imprint that's been left on me through the sport of wrestling it's just that tolerance for ambiguity is, is very high and something that you know not everybody has um something that not everybody has accustomed to in terms of you know having that tolerance yeah, definitely. And, and you mentioned taking some business classes there at NC State. Um, something I'm kind of curious about, you know, being an elite athlete like yourself, but also being in school, how much focus gets put on actual schoolwork and, and you know, looking towards the future as far as setting yourself up for a job based on your academics versus something like being a coach or going – to the Olympics or, or something like that as an elite athlete like yourself? Yeah. So that's a great question. And, and one that it took me some time to figure out just because I first got on campus and um, my expectations were high for myself. My coaches expectations for me were really high. And um, I thought that if I just put everything into wrestling and uh, spent all my time worrying about it, then I was going to be better in the long run, which wasn't the case. And so, I went through a red shirt year where I was just really learning the ropes in terms of wh where do I see myself in terms of academics? Because at that point I was just, I'm just going to focus on wrestling and the rest will kind of come naturally. But I needed to take the same approach that I had in wrestling um, into my academics. And I just kind of started telling myself, all right, it, this, 
how you're preparing for this test, how you're preparing in class, is that really what an elite wrestler would do if they were in practice? And so I just kind of would trick myself into, you know, creating a high level scenario for all that stuff. And I started to find a lot of joy in certain topics. And what I ended up uh, majoring in uh, was business administration with the concentration and human resources. And how I kind of describe that to people is just, how do you motivate employees? How do you um, keep them engaged? How do you motivate them through pay? How do you motivate them through um, the relations they have with their other employees? Um, how do you motivate them um, through the recruiting process? And there's so many different um, aspects of human resources, but I felt like I had done a lot of that um, through wrestling and, and through being like a, a leader on the team. And so a lot of people, when they think of human resources, it's like Toby from the office or somebody that's like um, almost like a, like a security guard in the, in the workplace. But there's so many things that you can do as an employer to motivate your employees in a way that they want to be motivated. And I think it's, it's seeing each individual person as their own and, and they have their own things that motivate them. And I feel like being on a team of guys that were so different and so diverse, um, I was able to see what motivated them. And, and whenever problems would arise, you have to fix them as a team and you have to fix them as a captain. And so I feel like I was so used to being involved with that process that, you know, going into human resources was, was a pretty logical stepping stone. And although in no way am I an expert, like whenever other of like all of my other um, classmates, I think I was with maybe one other athlete in the human resources concentration. They're full of like, like a hundred kids, um, you know, all of them had these summer internships and where they came back with these ideas where um, the things that they were doing at Red Hat or things that they were doing at Cisco. And I was just amazed by it all. And I just thought it was so cool. And so I started to really learn a lot from my classmates. And although they had that like internship um, opportunities, I was kind of too busy focusing on, you know, it, it's very hard to have that kind of internship as a division one athlete, um, especially just with the expectations of, of when you need to be on campus and where you need to be training. So although I didn't have that, I, I learned so much from it. And that's something that I keep in my back pocket just because I feel like, you know, if wrestling, you know, stops, you know, I need to have something I can do. And that's definitely a field that I would really love to be interested in going in um, or just like, you know, maybe owning my business someday. That's something that I can definitely take away from, from wrestling. And, you know, if that inevitably ends. Yeah. So it really sounds like a lot of your wrestling mentalities really bleed into everyday life and, and school and all that kind of stuff. Um, so not to jump over your senior year, cause I know that's good. That's going to be a huge thing, but where do you see yourself in a few years as far as, you know, do you, do you see yourself trying out for the Olympics? Do you see yourself trying to become a, an elite coach at a college level or high school level, or you think you might switch into MMA or anything like that? To be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, but, uh, I guess I have a few options and that's all I've kind of wanted. I wanted to have a lot of options I can choose from and, and whatever the best opportunity comes, that's probably what I'm thinking of. But for right now, I'm really focused on just getting the most out of my last year. Um, you know, there's, there can be wrestling afterwards, but this is the last year where you're on a team and you're, um, you know, you're going for the goals that you set out for since you're a little kid. And so I'm really focused on that. And, and at the end, if, if a coaching opportunity comes, I would love to stay, you know, for one, I'd really love to stay in NC state and finish out, um, help coach my brother, um, help coach those guys that have come, um, after me just because they've left such a great, um, impression on me. And I, I want to stay with those guys as long as I can. And, um, I feel like I've done enough, um, in leadership where I feel like I'd be a great coach. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of avenues that open up for me after that. Um, as for the MMA thing, uh, I have no idea about MMA. I'm very one dimensional in terms of, I know wrestling. I don't know anything else other than that. And so I'll joke around a lot on Twitter saying that, um, like somebody like Chael Sonnen is my head coach in terms of MMA, although I've never met the guy and I've never talked to him. And so I joke a lot about that and also joke a lot about uh, being tag team champions uh, with Trent, uh, my brother. And so there's a lot of joking around about that. Would I ever be 
um, motivated to actually step in and do MMA? I have no idea. Um, it would have to be a very perfect opportunity where somebody taught me how to actually do that. Um, I think I've, I've got a little bit more better opportunities at this point, um, either coaching or keep wrestling for as long as I can. I, I know that I don't want to wrestle until I'm 30. I, that just doesn't seem like something I want to do. Um, I'm really focused on this last year and just kind of expending all of my energy I can as an, as a competitor to that year. And if there's still things left over, um, you know, maybe just keep wrestling. But at this point, I don't feel like I have a whole lot to prove as an athlete. I'm, I'm in a very peaceful state of mind in terms of what I've accomplished and, and what I still have yet to accomplish. And I feel really confident doing it this year where, um, you know, I, I can leave uh, if I want to leave at that point, I can do it in a way that's I'm at, I'm at peace with it. So it sounds like in a good way, you're very focused on the present moment. And since you know options are going to unfold, it's not like you have to spend a ton of time going through the thought exercises of what you're going to do afterwards and stuff like that. So rewinding the clock back then a little bit to, we'll say not quite present moment moment yet, but uh, recent events. So preceding the pandemic and all of that chaos, you were number one or number two in the country going into nationals? Yeah, I was number two. Got you. Behind Deacon? Yep. So before this year, you you know, you know kind of talked a, a little bit in passing about how you were an All-American twice. Of course, that doesn't really do it justice. You had maybe, in my opinion, I'm not sure your opinion, uh, one of the absolute toughest weight classes. Um, in the, in the NCAs, probably both years, um, I probably won't do as well as you would recalling off the top of my head, but for the wrestling fans listening, having brackets full of people like Deacon and Jason Nolf and Caleb Young and like these very heavy hitters that have been household names in the wrestling community for, for a long time, all in one bracket, um, has happened to you multiple years <laughs> in a row um, at the college level, which is crazy. And you can fill in the blanks here as I may or may not mess some stuff up. But you had, we'll go back to your redshirt freshman year, so uh, uh, two full seasons ago, three if you include this year, um, you made your finals run as a true freshman, and you were undefeated that year. So we can kind of just start there as our our quote-unquote current events what was it like kind of tackling that year head on as a freshman going undefeated that whole time up until the finals when you wrestled Nolf? Yeah, so that was my, I, I took a red shirt year, um, my first year at NC State. And then that second year was whenever I was a freshman. And so uh, that red shirt year that I had before that was just such a important way for me to learn about academics and also learn, you know, about what it really takes to be a great college athlete. Cause at that point, I was a great high school wrestler, um, but it, it takes a little bit more. It takes a little bit more focus to be a great college athlete. And so I, I spent a year learning about that. And um, I just feel like once I jumped on the scene, I had done a lot beforehand to just allow me to jump forward. And so that whole year, I did take a loss in the regular season. I got second. Um, but I think I ran into the pound for pound, probably best guy in NCAA wrestling. Um, in both years of my, you know, of, of being an All-American. And so, you know, there's nothing to, to you know, hang your head about um, for losing to a guy like that. Um, but I, I felt like I just went – I went into a, a great bracket and I just learned so much from that process of wrestling all those great guys that um, it's going to prepare me for the moments where all right, I'm the oldest guy in the bracket. I feel like that was kind of similar to what happened when I was in high school um, – I won a state championship my senior year, but all the way before that I was taking losses and, and having to learn a lot. And so I just felt like once I got to the point where I was the oldest guy, I had all that to look back on and, and prepare me for the moment that I was about to have. Um, and so like college right now, it's going through a little bit of the same thing where I wrestled the, probably the best guy in NCAA wrestling for two years. Um, I did okay against him. And, you know, I can look back at that time and think, all right, I went, I went up against the best guy and, and I took him to a limit that he hadn't seen before. And so I can use that to give myself confidence in terms of, all right, you can definitely achieve what you want. Um, you know, just because there were some setbacks along the way doesn't mean that you won't have your moment as well. 
Yeah, and just to paint the picture a little bit more fully, I know that you kind of talk about it humbly when you say you pushed him to a level that he hasn't been pushed before, but it's actually a pretty controversial match in that was it the the first period you got a takedown remove that essentially if it was kept, you would have won the the match? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But so how it goes, it was like I I kind of take down right at the end of the period and they awarded it to me. Um, they went to review and they took it off. Um, I mean, I still think I got a takedown. But after that, um, you know, I ended up losing the match. I believe it was 3-2. And so a takedown there would have been huge. Um, it wouldn't have by any means sealed the match. There was a whole two other periods left. But um, it was definitely a critical moment in the match for sure. Yeah, and then on top of that, maybe I'm misremembering the match here, but even at the end of the third, you were, like, very, very close to covering the hips for another takedown. Yeah, so in the third period, I, I like, the last 30 seconds, I went on a run, and um, I almost got a takedown. That one I definitely didn't have a takedown on, but it was it was close. I mean, it, it nobody would have ever rewarded that, too, but it was I was in the process of a takedown, so – Definitely close, but, I mean, no cigar in the end. Um, definitely a match where you look back at some of those individual moments and you're thinking, holy smokes, if I would have done maybe just one thing a little bit different, um, I might have been able to score it in both of those situations. But, I mean, I don't have any regrets about the match for sure. I've talked about it quite a bit. Um, and I don't – I definitely don't blame anybody um, for my loss other than myself just because it's it's very hard – um, for somebody like me to try to blame, uh, you know, a controversial call or a ref's decision. Um, I just don't like to do that. I think it, I think it makes people look bad when they look back on that and have regrets. And so I've just been very open about it and, and very understanding of how it all went down. Yeah. I think that speaks kind of parallel to a mentality that I've been trying to put in practice a, a lot in the last year both in and outside of wrestling. Again, of course, my wrestling's at a lower level, but this idea of taking extreme ownership of everything that's conceivably in your control. So I think along the same lines, it um, speaks volumes in a good way to maybe younger people looking up to you or the fans watching you, regardless of their age, to see you not complaining about the call, but you know, in instead of saying that that takedown should be overturned or whatever and being highly opinionated about that saying instead things along the lines of like I shouldn't have left it in the ref's hands type of thing and I think that you and any other wrestler that kind of embodies that mentality goes on to like uh let that mentality bleed into the rest of everything else that they do to take ownership of you know the outcome even if it's easy to complain about is that intentional you think on your part yeah I think that's a good way to put it I think you know how you act during you know your low points of the drought is how people will remember you for um whenever you're on top and you know I look forward to the day where I mean I don't I don't look forward to the moment like where I'm on top or anything like that but you know how people are going to remem remember me in a few years you know it might be it might be because of how I acted during times when things didn't go my way and so I think that's just a good way to live your life just because there's so many things that are going to go against you. But the people that sit through that and they kind of, you know, they take a lot of self-pity. I feel like those are the people that have a hard time moving up and have a hard time moving on. Um, I've just always taken that that way. And, you know, people might be different. It's hard. You know, people go through some very challenging times and it's a, understandable that they, you know, feel like they're wronged in a way. But for me, I just feel like the best way for me mentally to move over things is just to keep moving and, um, you know, not, not think about, you know, how I was shafted in a way or anything like that. I just don't, I feel like I've been given too many things, too many positive things in my life that, you know, I'm pretty happy um, with how things are right now that, you know, I, I don't want to look back at a referee's decision and, and, and try to, you know, make that guy feel bad about it or make my opponent feel bad about it just because, I mean, I've trained with Jason Nolf, and uh, he's a guy that I consider a friend, and I think he's a really good person. So I definitely don't discredit what he's been able to do. Um, I have a lot of respect to, for him, and I, I, that's why I would never really like try to make it a habit of complaining about what happened. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And even beyond, you know, 
looking good in the public spotlight of how you handled those problems. I think it's advantageous just like at the individual level to put yourself in the driver's position of your problems and take responsibility for them as opposed to kind of playing the victim and blaming other people because then that kind of reinforces the self narrative, I guess, that those things, I guess, are outside of your control, which aren't necessarily true. But beyond that, I know you talked about that match extensively plenty of times, but what I don't think I have heard you talk about as much as following that match, you bounced back against Deacon, who's a very tough wrestler, as you referenced to, now ranked number one. Mm -hmm. um, and you had beat him in the Concy semis of that tournament, correct? Yeah, so pretty much what happened was um, I wrestled Friday night against Nolf. Uh, I lost that match. I woke up Saturday morning. Um, my body felt like it had been through the meat grinder. And I had talked to my coach, like, all right, how are you feeling? I said, I feel pretty terrible, but um, I'm definitely going to go out on my shield today. And so I was like, I don't really care what happens. I don't care about the wins and losses at this point. You know, I went out, I went, I set out to be a national champion and, you know, that wasn't going to happen. And so I just wanted to show my best uh, dexterity or just, just showed my best that I could. And so I went in um, to those Saturday morning consolations. I won my first match and then I ended up losing a third and fourth place match, which I mean, at that point, the difference between third and fourth to me wasn't a great deal. I mean, it's was a that great... Pantelio that you wrestled? Yeah, yeah. So that was a guy I beat early in the tournament, and then he beat me. Is a great rival for me all throughout my career, and um, you know, he got the best of me that day. And it was like I wasn't, I wasn't concerned. I wasn't in the dumps about how I performed at that point. I just wanted to go out there and be myself. And so uh, I felt like I did a good job of that. And even though I got fourth at that tournament. I feel like I wrestled way better than I did the year before when I got second. And that's kind of all I, all I want to do is do my best that I can. And I felt like that, that weekend I gave it my absolute best. I certainly made a lot of mistakes in that third and fourth place match, but I don't really, I don't really think about it at this point. It's not really something that I really care about. So now this year, your junior year, did things feel any different, you know, prior to the whole coronavirus pandemic outbreak and everything? Did you feel like you were firing it on all cylinders and ready to go? Um, can you talk a little bit about this year? Yeah, so this year I started out the year as like the preseason number one. Um, I wasn't feeling any pressure in terms of that, but my performance wasn't very good in the beginning of the year. Um, I was kind of a little bit more conservative. There wasn't as much um, – I mean, like, there's, there's always going to be pressure, but I felt like I was more wrestling not to make mistakes. And so – I went out to Vegas and I was wrestling Deacon and he beat me in, in a pretty convincing way. And so that was just a perfect time for me to sit back and, and kind of do more of, of what had gotten me so far and not worry about like a number beside my name. And so after that, I went on a, on a tear. And um, to be honest with you, I didn't really have any challenging matches a after that. Um, I think I went on like a, I want to say it was like a 22 match win streak up until, um, you know, when the pandemic hit. And so I was definitely firing on all cylinders, especially at the conference tournament. Um, I did really well there, and I was, I was just very uh, fluid with my mo movements, and my offense was very high. Um, and so that was just a, a good kind of progression throughout the year where I saw some adversity early, and I was able to really test myself and just kind of take a step back and – focus more on being aggressive, focus more on being confident. And um, I had a really great season in terms of, you know, looking back at everything, I think it was a great season. What was that like at the conference tournament, being only a couple hours away from home? Probably had a pretty big mix of fans, both at the college level and then a bunch of people that remember you from high school. Yeah, Did that so, feel any different? So earlier in the year, we actually dual, we had a dual meet against Pitt at Pitt. And so I had a lot of, um, family members and a lot of people from my community that came. Um, that was super cool just because they hadn't seen me and Trent wrestle in a few years, but some of those people. And um, it was just really cool to be in, in an environment where, you know, you looked in the crowd and yeah, there was a lot of pit people there, but I probably had 60 to 70 people from Lewistown that showed up and it was a sea of red almost. And so 
it was, that was really cool. And then going back to the conference tournament is a bit of the same. Um, I always just enjoy to see the, the people I don't usually get to see. Um, especially guys like my old high school teammates where, you know, I can't expect them to drive eight hours to come see me wrestle in North Carolina. So whenever we are back in Pennsylvania, I've always had past teammates that have showed up and have watched. And that was such a cool thing, especially this year too. Um, we went and wrestled at Drexel and my older brother, he went to her sign college, which is outside of the Philly area. And, um, there is like six or seven of his football players, um, that he played with. Um, that were there at that match. And I was, that was the coolest thing ever. My older brother didn't even get to go. And so after that match, I, I went and, and hung out with some of those guys. And it's just a cool, um, it's just a cool thing to have that kind of support to people that maybe I didn't even, I didn't even go to school with. Um, but, you know, they feel a connection, a connection to, you know, my career. And that's all I've ever hoped for. So if we jump back to high school just a little bit, what, what was the decision like to decide to go to NC State when you live, you know, you live so close to Penn State, which is pretty well known for wrestling. What kind of stuff went, went on there? What made you decide NC State was definitely a place you wanted to be? Yeah, so um, in terms of like, you know, Pennsylvania schools, um, there was interest, um, but there really wasn't any interest at all from Penn State. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm not going there. Um, I looked at some other schools like Lehigh who has a great wrestling tradition and, um, and Pitt a little bit. Um, but I, I had a personal connection to NC state. Um, my assistant coach at the time, Frank Beasley, he, he married a, a woman from Lewistown. And so he was a lot, he was always in the area and I was able to form a relationship with him. And, um, that kind of opened the gate to seeing, um, the people at NC state and seeing how their mentality was created. And, um, at that point, it was a very, you know, up-and-coming program because they they basically had to make a clean slate um, back in, I would say, 2012, um, 2011, 2012. They got a new coaching staff. Every single one of the guys on the team, except for one, ended up quitting. And so there was a whole new wave of people that were coming in. And um, I didn't know many of those guys just because they were like a startup at the time. But as I got older in high school, I saw these guys and they saw the way they trained and um, I would see them at tournaments. And I just really fell in love with the idea of kind of the NC state pack mentality. And um, it's a very disciplined team and a very disciplined culture, but that was something that I really wanted. Um, and so it was a pretty easy um, decision for me, to be honest with you. I didn't have to think a whole lot about it. There are some other schools that I liked and things about them that I liked, but I feel like NC State was such a great fit for me personally, just because you don't want to make a decision just based off wrestling. But at the end of the day, you're spending, you're spending so much time with these guys. Like you're going to class with them. They're your classmates as well. Um, they're your people that you're hanging out with. It's, it, it's a, it's a fraternity without booze and like paying your dues, I guess that's kind of how it is. And so I wanted to make sure I was with a, a team that, um, was special and a team that kind of fit my culture. I know that like since you got there and I'm sure you know the the details from before you got there better than I do but put kind of generally NC State before coach uh, Pat got there wasn't exactly a national powerhouse. I don't know exactly how they were doing but I know they weren't cracking the top 10 or anything like that and you know with the four years now that you've been there with Pat, how do you think he and all the other coaches that I don't know, I'm, I'm sure are also playing a big role, kind of, they're just off my radar. How did they turn that around to now being number six in the country? So to start out at the beginning, um, it definitely had to be like a pretty cutthroat operation when Pat showed up, just because at that point you had guys uh, not doing the right things, I guess, to, to put it, generously um and so what they were looking for was a pretty much a, a whole culture rebuild and kind of flipping it on top of itself and so pat got in there um and like i said earlier there was one guy from that roster that he inherited that ended up staying all four years with him and so he had to bring in so many new guys um and they had to basically start over in terms of you know what they expected out of those guys and at that point you had a lot of people who were skipping workouts and you know, just something as simple as that was, it was not going to fly with Pat. So he had to be very, very strict with, 
with how he wanted to run his operation because what he tells me all the time is when we first got there, we didn't have enough talent to work with where we could, um, where we could take it easy on them. We had to really test them physically. And so like one of the things that they would do a lot was they were running on the track probably three to four times a week. And, um, that doesn't get you any better at wrestling at some extent, but he was just doing it to really find out which guys could make it and which guys were willing to put in that effort in order to be something great in the end. And as the year started going by, they're starting to develop more talent. They're starting to get better recruits in who are kind of infusing um, more talent into the culture. And you know, they don't have to do stuff like that anymore where they're making you run 25 laps on the track, you know, in terms of doing 25, 400s or doing that three times a week. They don't have to do that anymore just because it's been able, they've been able to create a culture where we can kind of facilitate ourselves in terms of if you're not doing the right things, it's going to be very hard to survive and thrive in that kind of environment, especially in live wrestling, you know, whenever you go to practice and if you're not a guy who is doing the right thing, it's going to show pretty quickly. And so we're able to, as a team now, that we have a lot of talent. We have a lot of guys that work hard. We're able to kind of keep that tradition going as and create like more of a legacy rather than having coaches barking at you to doing the right thing. It's just kind of turned into something where guys start developing the right traits and developing the right mindset to training. Has he been as vocal with you that whole time with, of course he preceded you by however many years, not, not too long, but, has he been vocal about his intent with, you know, workout regimens and stuff like that? Because just speaking personally, I feel like our coach has been that way, actually, even in high school. And it's always been reassuring to kind of understand the why behind what the leader of the team is doing. And it seems like from what you're saying, he's pretty good about doing that. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, so um, – I think it is important. He, he wants us to know why we're doing the things that we're doing. Um, but like he, he'll tell us whenever we go down to the track or whenever we're at the football stadium carrying each other on our backs, he'll let us know, you know, this isn't necessarily going to make you have a better um, takedown in wrestling. But what this will do is it's preparing your body to go through a moment where you're in a match and you're stuck late and you need to find a way to get a takedown when you're dog tired. And, pushing yourself through that kind of conditioning really gives you a, a sense of, of mind that you're going to be in there at some point. And I don't feel like there's anything that we do that's not important or that's, you know, more of like punishment or anything like that. I just don't think of it that way. Um, but he is very conscientious about telling us why we're training the way we're training um, at certain points of the year, um, why we take off um, at some points, uh, why we push harder at some points in the year, because I know a hard time for guys is like right before the ACC tournament, we'll spend, we have off that week before and there's like a two week break between ACCs. And so during that first week, we train really hard. We go like really hard conditioning. It's not as much focused on like live wrestling, but we're doing a lot of bike sprints. We're doing, you know, a lot of sprints in general and we're lifting hard and it's hard to like, Sometimes you have guys say, like, why are we training this hard whenever we're just about to get to the postseason? But what they don't realize is the week after that, we take, it off, take time off and our bodies are ready to perform at the highest level for the postseason. And so he's always been really good about telling us things like that. And now that you're, you know, you're after it's, – it's after your uh, junior year and you're in the summer now, what's like a day-to-day – workout and training session look like to you and now that you're back home essentially on your own without your coaches what do you do to stay motivated and keep going and and putting in all that work yeah so for the most part right now it's me and my brother trying to figure out things as we go um it's it brings me back to like when i was a junior high athlete where you're kind of formulating these schedules on your own and you're not really sure um if you're doing the right thing all the time but for me i have enough um intelligence in terms of wrestling where I know what to work on I've been more focusing on working on techniques that I can improve on um, that's been the major focus it hasn't been on seeing how hard I can train I do need to I need to train hard in terms of doing strength training things like that but 
conditioning right now is not at the forefront of things that I need to be worried about. Even though I have an itch and I have to do cardio a couple times a week, um, that that's just there for my piece. You know, whenever I do cardio, it's not for making myself a better wrestler. It's just to give me, get my body in the right spot and give me peace. I don't think of it as training for wrestling, but you know, the strength training I'm doing is, is correlated to what our, our strength coaches sent us to do. Um, and I'm wrestling, it's been a lot on our own, but I feel like I'm at the point now where I can just really focus in on the techniques that I need to get better on. And, um, you know, just getting a new feel for things has been important. Um, Trent and I have been training with a couple of different guys that we're not used to training. Um, some of them might be high school kids or other college guys in the area, but um, it, it's just been a good kind of time for us um, to sit back and, and look at things that we need to improve on. And I can tell you that um, wrestling with Trent, he's just taken steps and bounds um, after this postseason with the things that he's been working on. And uh, he's been able to formulate new attacks and new takedowns that um, I think people are going to be really shocked with once they see him next year. But it's, it's been hard for sure, but um, I feel like we've made the most out of it and been able to keep our bodies ready for once we go back, our coaches are going to be able to walk us through the process a little bit better than we can on our own. And so in the off season, I know this isn't really like a typical off season for you, but in the off season, how much do you worry about maintaining your weight and, and watching that? Yeah. So, um, guys on our team are a lot different. Um, I've had guys, I've had a time where, um, you know, all of the guys in lighter weight classes than me were at the same weight. And so I, I wrestle 157 pounds and there's at one point where our, um, 133 pounder was like weighing the same as I do. And it's just, it's different. People are different in the off season. They, they gain a lot of weight. And then once it gets closer to the season, they get down to a more comfortable weight for me. I like to stay around the same weight all year. And so I'll stick around 170, um, right now. And maybe once the season hits, I'll be more closely down towards like 167. Um, but then I, I'll cut the rest of that off, like the week of. And so, Has that been a conscious choice for you to not really cut weight? Or do you think you're naturally just like have a low body fat physique? Yeah, so that definitely brings a, a big part into it. I don't, I'm not a person that can cut a whole lot of weight. Like I think 10 pounds is a really good limit for me because it's enough where um, – like on any given day, I can lose, I can lose six pounds in a wrestling workout, or I can do and go and do cardio and I can lose four to five. And it's just, it's just nice to be able to like be two to three workouts away from being on weight. And so, um, there is like cutting back calories and there is definitely cutting back water day of, or maybe like the night before. Um, but it was definitely a conscious decision on my part where I don't want to focus the off season on trying to get weight bigger because I know, um, like I know for a fact that I'm one of the strongest guys um, in my weight class, if not the strongest guy. So I'm doing the right things in terms of my strength training, but I don't feel like I need to get bigger. That, that, that wouldn't help me at all. It would just put more stress on me to lose that weight off um, once the season starts coming around. And so I've, my numbers have been going up in terms of my strength. Um, you know, all the, the uh, major lifts, they've all been going up since I started my freshman year, but um, I've been more at a consistent weight throughout. And I think that has just helped me stay on track. And, you know, any given day I, I can make weight, give me four days in advance, I'll, I'll be down at 157. And I think that just creates a, a good steady level of, you know, you're used to training at that weight. And in the past, and maybe whenever I've gotten up too big, um, I've been able to feel it in my training. Like I feel really good whenever I come into practice and I weigh like I'm in that sweet spot of 168 to 170. Like that's whenever I feel my best. And so I just like to be around there in the off season because it gives me a good sense of how I'll be training during the season. Yeah. I know just speaking for myself, I was in a weird position in high school where I jumped in and out of seemingly nowhere became obsessed with the sport. And in doing so, I looked to a lot of people that I considered really good wrestlers around me and tried to imitate them. And one of the few unfortunate bad habits that I picked up is that I imitated that some of the people who at that time I thought was the pinnacle of high school wrestling performance were cutting weight pretty rapidly. And unsurprisingly, I started doing the same thing in the years to come. So my junior and senior year of high school, it became very normal to go up as much as 
20 pounds over the 126 pound weight class that I was wrestling at the time and then have to rip that back down and then splurge afterwards and that was going through a repetitive loop and I'm kind of curious where your thoughts are on if you think across the board it might be better for uh, wrestling to implement we'll say at both the high school and college level since I don't think it's uh, quite as a and it invasive problem throughout all of youth youth wrestling right now but the high school and uh college level there has been a little bit of talks at least among my wrestling team about maybe implementing things like um same day hydration tests as weigh-ins which not looking at the cost issues with maybe doing something like that and just the the health stuff um I think there could be a chance, at least for the the purpose of thoughtful discussion, it might not be the end all be all best solution to that. But I think talking about those things might push us in in a direction of having maybe a solution to sharp weight cuts. Do you think that there's anything solution wise that exists out there to kind of eradicate really sharp weight cuts? Or do you think that's unnecessary evil that goes into having weight classes i i personally think it's a necessary evil i don't really like the idea of like of like doing hydration tests and like everybody weighing like what they're naturally at just because i've kind of looked at over the years and like yeah there were some definitely some tough times like my first year of high school where i had no idea how to cut weight and i was doing it the wrong ways but once i was able to figure it out I've been able to use that more of an advantage than anything else. Like whenever I prepare for a, a, a competition, I know that my weight cut's going to be probably pretty good. And I've done it enough where I have like a system down and I feel really good. And this probably sounds crazy to people, but I actually kind of like that little bit of edge that you have whenever you're down to weight. I just feel like it gets me in like a competitive spirit. And I feel like it's been, um, an advantage for me over the past couple of years is even though I'm a bigger guy for my weight class, I still, I do the right things in terms of cutting my weight properly. And, um, you know, whenever I'm getting my weight down, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm like, uh, starving myself. And uh, I think you would be surprised at, um, seeing how like all the teams do their weight cuts, because I know for once, um, my team, what we'll do on like a given day is I'll probably wake up, um, like five over um i'll do cardio and i'll get close down to weight um and then i'll eat a full breakfast after that of like some kind of pancakes or oatmeal or things like that and then i'll also have lunch that day um i'll come in about probably three hours before the match we'll have a pre-match workout where i cut the rest of my weight off then and so in the end i'm not skipping any meals um although i'm losing a lot of weight i'm doing it in a way that can fuel my body to where I'll be okay um, for the match time. And there are some, some people that don't cut weight correctly and it, it shows in their performance. But I just feel like if you're at that point, then you probably need to move up a weight class. Um, I don't really like the idea of, I think it's a pretty good test right now of um, you weigh in an hour before you wrestle. And if you don't cut weight properly, you're probably going to get burnt out there. And so, I don't know. There's always things you can fix, but I, I just kind of like the way it is for me now. I, I don't, I can't think of a better way for me to just um, show my discipline and show how I've, I've worked throughout the week at getting my weight down than what is now. And I don't think people look at that aspect of it enough is having a, a weigh in like this does reward the people who are doing the right things and in, in terms of their diet and in terms of the way that they get their weight down. Yeah, at face value of what you're saying, I think I do agree with you more with that argument than the argument of implementing something like same-day hydrations. So if I were to kind of flip that thought exercise, do you think it might be better to, we'll say, highlight the people who are dedicated on a daily, year-round basis in something like the UFC where they are not doing same-day weigh-ins? Um, certainly not one hour before the fight weigh-ins, but I think it's pretty typical to hear of UFC and Bellator fighters, you know, having their weigh-in one or two nights before the fight and then showing up to the fight 25 pounds or so heavier. 
have you thought about what it might look like at that level within professional MMA for them to implement something like same day weigh-ins? Yeah. So I, I've, I have seen like how crazy those weigh-ins can get just because they know that they can to some extent refuel their bodies with a whole day after weigh-in. So you have a, a probably close to 24 hours or if not more by the time you fight where you've already made weight. And so a lot of those guys see it as, okay, I can do whatever I need to, to my body just so I make the weight. And so you've got people cutting crazy amounts of weight, like, and sometimes it works out for them and sometimes it doesn't. And then a lot of times what highlights it is bad weight cuts and it, it gives a bad look for the people that do it correctly. But I definitely see some issues with the current process. Um, with how MMA is right now, just because they have such a long way in period. And I mean, if you look at like how college wrestling is, we have one hour and it's pretty firm one hour. Um, and I, I mean, it's, it's a test to be able to rebound after an hour, but you don't see a whole lot of people with like, you know, really having bad weight cuts and them not being able or them being hospitalized anymore. It used to be like that. Um, there used to be, you know, definitely some examples in wrestling of guys being hospitalized for bad weight cuts. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it's a shame that that had, that happened. But I think right now, um, I do think there needs to be more kind of a focus on high school kids. And, uh, I mean, the process for them cutting weight, it's not easy for them because they, one, they don't know exactly what they're doing other than watching somebody else do. And chances are they probably didn't right, didn't do it right either. And, I definitely didn't learn how to cut weight properly until I got to college. And so it's just, I don't like the idea of college kind of changing it, but I could definitely see high school being a little bit different. Um, and for sure there's a lot of problems with MMA today with weight cuts. So for somebody that's not ever wrestled past like elementary school, what does it look like to actually cut weight? What, what goes into that? So for me, um, I, I'm a big cardio guy. Um, I feel like I can lose weight easier doing that um, than wrestling. I feel like wrestling is a little bit more taxing on your body. Um, in the end, you can lose more weight from wrestling, but I mean, it's just a trade off. And for me, it's, it's different for all the guys on our team. But what I like to do is um, I'll do like, I'll wake up. So the morning of, um, say I have like a 6 p.m. weigh in, I'll do like, I'll wake up in the morning. I will uh, do. Um, I'll be like five over, like five pounds over. I'll put on just like sweatpants, a long sleeve shirt, um, and a sweatshirt. And, um, I'll go on the treadmill. I'll like, what I like to do is do like a 10 minute intervals where I'll do 10 minutes on a treadmill. I'll do like a rest period where I'm doing five minutes on elliptical. Then I'll do another 10 minutes on a treadmill and then five minutes on the elliptical. And then at that point I'll switch off doing like 10 minutes on a stair stepper and maybe to an, like another interval something like that but I just like to break it up just because it can kind of get boring whenever you're at the point where you're losing weight and so um that's kind of how like my workout will go um I'll lose all that weight off and I'll eat something later and then we'll come back in and um whenever we do our warm-up it uh for like the competition itself we'll do it before weigh-ins um and so we'll warm up and that's kind of our last weight cut where um, I don't like to do a whole, a whole big weight cut at that point, just cause it can kind of be stressful leading right up to Wayne's, but I'll just put on a pair of sweats or uh, work out in a long sleeve t-shirt. And at that point, my like 45 minute warm up, I can lose, um, anywhere from two to three pounds in that. And so, um, it's a good way throughout the day where you can still eat stuff. And then like, you're not going more than like half an hour without eating. So like I'll work out right before the match. Um, or right, right before weigh-ins, I'll get down to weight and then immediately be able to put something back in my body afterwards. Um, and then there's like an hour, hour later, we'll compete. Okay, nice. Um, so just switching gears kind of a little bit, what kind of goals and stuff do you have for your senior year coming up? Yeah, so to finish out, I, I, I would love to be an NCAA champion. That's the ultimate goal. Um, no matter how I get there, I think that's the end-all be-all. But I would just like to be consistent. I would like to, um, I would like to be, I, I know I'm not going to see my perfect wrestling beginning of the year, but I would like to, um, I would like to be tested early, but I would like to rise above that and just show that I'm a very complete wrestler throughout the year. Um, you know, 
I, I would like to be undefeated because that's something I've never done. Um, I did it my freshman year in the regular season, but I would like to be an undefeated wrestler. I think that just shows that I'm one of the best guys, not only in my weight class, but um, overall. That, that would be an ultimate goal for me. So on top of the NCAA is happening next year, we hope. Um, I know that the Olympic year, which should be happening in 2020, just got postponed to next year. I'm not sure because I haven't read much about it or listened to anything on it. If they're like bumping back the trials and redoing everything over again for the Olympic team. But if there is an outlet to make the Olympic team in 2020 or well, 2021, um, do you think you'll have a run at that as well? Definitely. I would love to go to the Olympic trials. That's, um, I, th- I think what they're doing is they're just putting it at the same weekend just a year later. And so what they do is they'll have NCAAs and then like two weeks after that, they'll have the Olympic trials. And so if I win NCAAs, I'll qualify for the Olympic trials. There's a couple other qualifiers before that, but I don't necessarily focus on them, especially just because I'm, I've got a hundred percent focus in on the NCAA season and I have to do my best to, you know, train for that moment. And, um, other guys have, have, have tried to, uh, you know, do both at the same time and some can do it well. But for me, I, I don't, I, I mean, I put weight in the Olympic trials, but I want to put as much weight as I can into my NCAA performance. And so that's kind of taking the front seat for me. Um, but I would love to go to the trials. Um, I can't say that I'm a, a large favorite to win anything there, but I still think it would be a great thing to, for me to do. And just having another year of training under my belt, I think I would do, I would do better than people think I do there. And so uh, uh, that's definitely something I would like to do, especially just because it, it'll be in state college and close to my hometown um, where the Olympic trials will be. So that, that'll be, um, that would be something I would be interested in. Yeah, just as a fan and and as a friend, I think it would be awesome to see you go to the trials or yeah, to go to the trials by using the of course the NCAA champ status to kind of put you in that position. I think maybe there's a chance that that gives you all the more reason to come out on top as if you, you know, didn't already have enough reasons to you know, be pushing you forward towards wanting to stand on top of the podium at NCAs. But it seems like that's just one more piece of the puzzle that, you know, being the NCAA champ will unlock for you to shoot you right into the team trials. Yeah, so I think this year it was the same circumstances. If you won NCAAs, you qualified for Olympic trials. And what Trent and I talked about is we're going to put all of our focus on NCAAs and we're going to get hot. Um, we're going to qualify for Olympic trials and we'll show up and, and um, shock the world. And so that was kind of our plan. And uh, although it, none of them happened, it was still a pretty good plan in place to, um, we weren't focusing much on the Olympic trials, but we had a, like a couple weeks in advance where we could maybe focus more on those opponents rather than our NCAA uh, opponents. And so it's a tricky thing to deal with, but I mean, that's what, that's what you got to do. It's either the NCAA athletes are not at an advantage at all um, for the Olympic trials and that's okay. So definitely we're not going to participate in it next year. That's awesome. Well, Hayden, I think we probably exhausted a layperson friendly uh, wrestling podcast, which was awesome. I'm glad that we had a, a wrestling centric episode with one of the absolute highest performing wrestlers that I know. So thank you for coming on before we get totally wrapped up here. Um, as long as my buddy Nick doesn't have any more um, pending questions. One that uh, I have wanted to ask for a while, and it's kind of crazy that I even still remember this because this wasn't something I recently had dug up or anything with this uh, podcast coming up that we were doing, but something that uh, you posted on Instagram years ago when you had won your uh, state championship, a quote that stuck out to me, to, to me forever and I had like written down on my quote board for a while before I started like posting daily quotes or whatever was I think it's a Mark Twain quote and it's something to the tune of there are the two there are two days that are the most important days of your life the day you were born and the day you figure out why I don't know if that was a premeditated quote but it stuck out to me for a very long time when you posted that or premeditated on posting that what was kind of going through your head as you were pondering how that quote applies to you and 
your wrestling career? Yeah, so it was definitely premeditated. That was something I was thinking of just like when I have this moment, it's like, because in, in high school wrestling, the ultimate goal was to be a state champion. I, I had come close where I wanted that so badly. And I think once I finally won, it was just one of those moments where it was like, wow, I just spent like, I just spent 13 years of my life trying to do this. And I did. And that moment was just like, all right, if you do this, you know, if you do what you did into any areas of your life, you're going to be a successful person. And so that moment when I won, I was just thinking, I found out my purpose. I found out, you know, everything that I had done up to that point was, was all worth it. And it was all for this moment. And, uh, you know, when I think about that Mark Twain quote is, you know, there's the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you found out why, you know, when I found out why it was just that extra little bit of comfort and peace where, um, you know, my journey all along has, has been special to me. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter about the wins or losses, but it does matter about the moment of, of figuring out that, that what you did was worth it. And so I take that a lot into every time I, I take that a lot in every day of my life and, and thinking, or, you know, are you doing the right things for your purpose? Or are you, are you keeping true to yourself that you were whenever you were an 18 year old kid and you like won your first state title? Um, that I think about that a lot and crazy you bring that up because I haven't thought about that in a while, but um, it, you know, I have different variations of that quote that I live by, I guess, but you know, in the moment it, it seems a little bit crazy to say that like, Oh wow, you must be pretty full of yourself to think, oh, your purpose of your life is winning a state title. That that wasn't what it meant to me. It just meant the process of the way that I did it. That was kind of what my purpose was. Man, what a way to wrap it up. That's awesome. <laughs> so man, I appreciate you coming on and talking to us. That's this is probably one of my favorite shows so far. So uh, thank you guys so much. I had a great time. And best of luck, man, with your senior year and everything beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good luck with everything, guys. Uh, you guys are doing a great job, and you know I really enjoy everything that you guys post and, and things like that. So you know, keep up the great work. Thanks, Thanks, man. Could you tell people where they could find you if they want to follow you on social media or anything like that? Yeah, so on Twitter, uh, my handle is Hydely Mania, uh, kind of like a spinoff of Hulkamania. Uh, but on Instagram, it's just very generic, Hayden Hydely. Awesome. All righty. Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. Yeah, you too. See ya. All right, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Please track us down on social media. Our Facebook is Insights of All Trades. Our Instagram is at Insights of All Trades. Our Twitter is at IOAT Podcast. And you can find us on Gmail. It is Insights of All Trades at gmail.com. So please just send us in your insights. It would mean a lot to us and a lot to everyone else. Meaning, send in any tips or tricks you've learned through your trade or your passion that you think everyone would benefit from knowing. So until next time, adios.